Hi everyone and welcome, or welcome back to this indie app design series. If you're new here, my name is Daria, I'm a digital designer and illustrator, and this is Osketch, the creativity app for artists featuring daily drawing challenges, prompts, and inspiration that I have been designing over the past four months. In the previous video, I talked a bit about the concept of the app and how the idea came to be, so feel free to check it out. You will find the link in the top right corner of the screen and in the video description. Today's video is all about getting started with wireframes and making design choices when it comes to UI elements. Without further ado, let's get into it. Every design and every idea begins with a sketch in your notebook, where essentially you just pour everything you have in your mind onto paper, trying to define the concept, structure, and general functionality of the app. Eventually, however, you will need to clean up the rough lines, literally and figuratively. And that's where wireframing software comes into play. Wireframes are sort of a blueprint or a visual guide to your project. Essentially, they're just 2D snapshots of your interface design, which show the functional components of your app and how they work together. The focus in wireframing is on structure and functionality rather than aesthetics. That's why you will often find wireframes that are completely strapped off any decorative graphic elements. Once you have a more or less clear structure, you can then start adding more elaborated designs on top of it. Alternatively, you can do it like me and turn your wireframing process into pure chaos, whatever works for you. There are many wireframing programs out there. Miro, Sketch, Mugflow, Figma, just to name a few. My husband and I love using Figma because you can use it directly in your browser, the live collaboration feature works great, and overall the UI is very straightforward and easy to use. Figma offers a free basic plan that allows you to create up to three collaborative files, so it's a great option if you're working on a single project. Since Osketch was designed in Figma, I will talk a bit about how the software works. Getting started is fairly easy. Once you create and open your first design file, you land in your workspace. In the middle, you have your working area with some functional panels around it. To start with, you can go ahead and add some frames with the frame tool from the bottom bar. This allows you to create artboards or in our case, phone screens. You can also choose from multiple presets if you want to create a design for a specific phone size. You can use different tools from the bottom bar to add elements such as shapes and text to your frames. Once you start adding elements to the canvas, they will appear in the layers on the left, sorted under the respective frame. You can select single or multiple objects, reshuffle them, group them together, etc. If you've already worked with some kind of design software before, you will find a lot of features very familiar and intuitive. Objects can also be directly selected on the canvas, which will allow you to adjust their position, size and styling in the design panel on the right. In the design panel, you can also create reusable variables for your styles, which I will come back to in a bit. Another important feature I use a lot is checking the margins between elements. For that, select an element, hold down an option or alt key, and hover over neighboring elements to see distance to them. On the right from the design panel, you can see a prototype tab, which allows you to build connections between frames and previewing the created flows. It's a very handy feature when you need, for example, to present your project in a team. Since we're a team of two and my husband usually implements everything I design right away, we do not really need it or we should use it, but we choose not to because we're lazy. <laughs> when designing an app, you will often find yourself reusing certain components, styling options, colors, etc and it can be quite tedious to do so manually. Luckily, most wireframing softwares will already have a built-in feature of creating a design system for your project. This includes, for example, saving the colors that you plan to use throughout the project as color variables. For that, simply give any element in your design the color that you want and click this plus button to create a new variable and give it a name. Next time you need this color, you can find it in libraries. In Figma, you can also add and edit variables by clicking away from any frame in your design and going to local variables in the design panel on the right. 
You can do the same for fonts, creating text styles for your headings, labels, paragraphs, and anything else you might need. Reusing doesn't only work for styling options, but also UI elements. A very straightforward example is navigation. You will need to add it to almost every screen in your project. When reusing more complex arrangements of elements, you can save them as components. For that, select the desired group of objects, in this case, the navigation, right-click and go to create a component. Components you create can be found and added with the Actions tool in the bottom panel. Simply go to Assets and type in the name of your component in the search bar. What I like to do is create a separate page for my components. I copy elements I want to turn into components here first to keep an overview of all of my master components, rename them, edit them, and so on. As you can see here, another great use case for components are buttons. It is a very recommended practice to make your buttons look consistent throughout the app. You can make them fixed width or even responsive, setting horizontal and vertical resizing of the button label to hug in the design panel. Saving such responsive button as a component will then allow you to add its instances that automatically adjust their size to the custom text inside. Sketch is a fairly small project, so I didn't want to bother too much with components. Apart from navigation and buttons, I did reuse some UI elements, but more of that later. If you watched the first video of this series, you will know that we defined four main parts of the app, with the daily challenge being the focus. I wanted the users to land on the daily challenge screen when opening the app, so that's the one I started with when designing Wireframes. The rough idea I had was to make challenges look like cards that you can swipe between, with a label above each card that indicates the date. I also wanted the screen to look very clean, so that the users who only want to quickly check the daily challenge can get this information fast without getting too distracted. For that, I decided to let the challenge cards only contain the short description of the daily challenge and provide extended details when clicked on. I wasn't sure if I should make details a separate screen or make the cards extendable and let users scroll down for more information. In the end, I decided to go for a prominent action button and a separate screen, since this way I have more space for challenge description should there be a really long one. Later, we added some export options to the challenges too, which meant a few extra icons on the screen. So having a separate screen for details turned out to be quite handy. Moving on to the next screen, the random prompt generator, I kind of just implemented the idea I had way in the beginning. Splitting the screen into three areas stacked on top of each other, each with a label and description and a heading at the top of the screen. When you click on any of the areas, a part of a drawing prompt is randomly generated. Of course, this sentence might not always make sense, so I wanted to give users an option to regenerate any part if they feel like it. After you've generated your first prompt, there is a heart icon appearing at the top to favorite the prompts that you like and save them for later. The third tab was initially planned as Studio, which would be some kind of a personal profile where you would have your saved prompts and challenges and also get personalized content suggestions. I like the idea of reusing cards and containers for consistency throughout the app, with the ones here each representing a section such as saved, art blog, etc. Saved screen is split into two sections marked by labels, saved challenges and saved prompts, as you can see, I also used cards in Save Challenges Carousel. I made the details show up when you tap on the challenge card, since it's something users already know from the daily challenge screen. Save prompts are essentially a sentence containing a drawing reference, so it seemed more fitting to display them in a vertical list. I felt like it also makes this screen a bit less repetitive. The fourth tab was then reserved for community, featuring completed challenges by users who posted their works on Instagram, and tagged OSketch account. The design for the screen was very simple, just an image grid with some header and description at the top. Later, however, I came to realize that this structure is not ideal. First of all, it might not be obvious to search for challenges and prompts you saved in the studio. Studio itself is also not an entirely obvious name for a place where you would get content suggestions. Settings as a small icon at the top of the studio screen would 100% get overlooked and I myself on multiple occasions forgot where I put it. That's why shortly before releasing the MVP, we actually restructured the app. Saved now became a separate tab since I felt like this is going to be one of the most used features in the app. 
Art blog, community challenges, and community posts are now nested inside of the Explore tab, since all of them fit into a category of new things and content to be discovered. And lastly, settings move to the Profile tab, which also contains information about your account and subscription. Of course, there are still a lot of wireframes to add here and there. For example, for the color palette challenge, export screen, setting screen, onboarding steps, and so on. Otherwise, that's the basic structure of the app at the moment. When designing an app, it's important to have a basic idea of how you want your users to experience the app, in which order you want them to perceive the information, use the functions, and so on. A great way to help users navigate better is by creating a visual hierarchy. What that means is that you can use design principles such as size, proportion, alignment, proximity, to guide users' attention throughout the app and direct them to certain actions. For example, generally larger items or items with high contrast will be noticed faster. Items of equal visual weight will be perceived as of same importance. Items with the same styling will be considered related to each other in some way. And if they are arranged close to each other, they will be perceived as a part of a group. So how do these principles play out in the app? For example, on the main screen of the app, the styling of the challenge cards suggests they belong to the same category. The difference in size, however, draws our attention to today's challenge card first. The white space inside of the challenge card makes us focus on its contents, while the high contrast primary button calls for action. Hierarchy is also very important in typography. Have a look at the block screen, for example. Larger and higher contrast font makes you read the article title first, then directing your attention to its description. At the same time, since none of the article block cards stands out too much, and there is a clear repetitive pattern, your eyes browse down through the list without getting stuck anywhere for too long. There isn't really a universal formula on how to use these tricks. And I also feel like it's totally fine to break the rules if you feel like it fits into the context of your app. App design involves a lot of playing around, so don't be afraid to try different things and see what works for you. Now that the app structure and layout are more or less clear, let's move on to the fun part, designing UI components. Of course, as a result of restructuring, the navigation went from containing four items to five. Generally, it's a good practice to add descriptive labels to your navigation to help the users easier recognize the tab contents. However, the more navigation items you have, the less space you have left for text in a size that is still readable. If you don't use labels, you need to make sure that the icons you use for your navigation are commonly associated with what they represent. For example, a heart for favorited things, a house for the home tab, or a cog wheel for settings. These are symbols that users most likely already know from other apps. As you can see in the old navigation, community has a perfectly recognizable symbol, but studio, not really, which is why I use labels. In the new version, I had to get creative to save space. Of course, neither the daily drawing challenge nor the random prompt generator are things that users would already be familiar with, since these are very app-specific features, but I still try to find icons that would help recognize these tabs over time. For daily challenge, I went with the calendar icon that has a star on it, and for the random prompt generator with a random shuffle symbol. I personally find that these icons fit quite well. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments if you have better suggestions for these symbols. Generally, there are two types of buttons you would use in an app primary and secondary. Primary buttons are used to turn users' attention to one important action. Usually it's a call to download, open, sign in, subscribe, upgrade, and so on. Primary button always stands out through contrast and proportion. Here, for example, a call to see details is a primary button, since reading a description of the daily challenge is essential to completing it. I will talk a bit more about the color palette in the next video, but as you can already see, there are quite a lot of colors used throughout this app. Usually when your color palette is limited, you can pick one color as the main color that you then use in your primary button to turn users' attention. In my case, however, there are so many equally bright, differently hued colors that picking one as primary would not make too much difference. Instead, I decided to go for black, which is a universal color and has highest possible contrast against a light app background. 
Secondary button, on the other hand, provides an alternative option. It usually has less visual weight and emphasis on the screen. For secondary buttons, a commonly used option is mirroring the colors and the shape of the primary button, but swapping fill for border to decrease visual weight. Another option is using text or underlined text only with an arrow icon to indicate that this is a link of some sort. We also have some secondary buttons in the form of a redirect link. For example, in the community challenges section, we decided to add these external link icons to make it more obvious that challenge cards can be tapped. These are very subtle since every single challenge has one and with too much prominence and contrast, the screen would look overloaded. As I already mentioned, there are quite a few cards used throughout the app. Cards and containers help to organize and categorize information on the screen and make it easier for users to perceive it. Cards on the main screen all belong to the pool of daily challenges. Cards and settings help separate general from account settings and so on. For consistency, I designed all cards and containers in the app to have slightly rounded corners. You will also see that many of the cards have black border and that was not only purely a statics decision. Since the background of the app is very light, I needed to create sufficient contrast to cards, and I could do that by either using very vibrant fills or adding a border. I did both throughout the app, depending on the feeling I wanted to go for for a specific screen. If the screen was otherwise not too overloaded, I would make the containers colored. Like for example, in the orange boarding, where you have a list of content preferences to select from. Here, I also reuse the border styling to mark options that are picked. Same as on the color palette export screen and the app theme selection screen. Overall, I tried to reuse as much styling as possible to reach that consistent look in the app. At the same time, like I mentioned in the previous video, I felt like adding variety and some interesting design choices since it's a creativity app for artists after all. In the end, it's a fine balance between keeping the app clean and organized and making it stand out in some way. I hope you enjoyed today's video and found some useful takeaways for yourself. In the next episode, I will go into branding, designing a logo, logo animation, picking the app color palette, designing themes, and so on. Please don't forget to leave a like if you found this video helpful and consider subscribing to my channel so that you stay up to date with the newest videos. If you have any questions or suggestions of what I should talk about in my next videos, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.